Do you ever have any dreams when you're a child? <laughs> How do you like the idea of singing on an opera stage with a brilliant opera singer? <laughs> That was amazing. She's got a marvelous voice. I've done this before. Uh, when I first did my first paper on happiness, uh, I regarded myself as Aristotle's research assistant. In this paper, I'm Dora's research assistant. <laughs> and Dora said, I, I want you to sing. And I said, that's okay. I'll do that standard number. But what if we can do it right with a real singer? So that's what we have. So thank you for Dora for making it all possible. Well, now I have to actually do something else. <laughs> that was fun. Can we just do an encore of that? <laughs> Usually I do that in order to give an introduction uh, to the next slide, which talks about the kinds of... Uh, ways of thinking about happiness. It, broadly speaking, there are three. Life evaluations, which are think about your life as a whole and how do you rate it. Positive emotions and negative emotions. Now, when we started the World Happiness Report, people said this is very confusing because happiness is used in several ways. We said, great, we like that idea and we'll use both of those definitions of happiness. So happiness is an emotion. And when we sang that song, we were asking you about happiness as an emotion. We could also have asked you, but this, it wouldn't have been as tuneful and you wouldn't have stamped your feet. How happy are you with your life as a whole these days? Or how happy are you with the baggage retrieval system they have at Heathrow? <laughs> it's a very different question. And so you think about it, and you evaluate all that's relevant to answering that question. So in the World Happiness Report, we do our primary concentration on life evaluations. And I'll explain a little bit why. And it, in this beautifully combined audience, when Dora asked me to give this talk, for this conference, I could not possibly refuse because she has done one of the leading acts in the world to bring together public health practitioners and experts with positive psychologists because that's, of course, we have to have a positive view injected in every one of the disciplines that actually create circumstances for, and try and improve the circumstances for people's lives. So, can I ask for kudos for Dora for doing that? It's, it's it, it's quite exceptional, and of course, it needs doing for prison management. It doing needs doing for childcare. It needs doing for all of the things where people are designing institutions and tweaking institutions in order to improve people's lives. And there are big implications for sustainability as well. Well, what you're seeing here are the top uh, 10 and the bottom 10 in evaluations in the most recent three-year period that we evaluate. And uh, Iceland's nestled in there at number three. I'm going to explain something about that unusual feature, and it's rather nice to come to a least half Nordic audience in order to say this, I'm going to be able to explain there's some very good happiness producing reasons why the Nordic countries are typically all in the top 10. Uh, now I'm going to tell you why we choose this umbrella measure of life evaluation as our primary way of ranking countries. And it's not a trivial decision because it's, it's probably turned the world's press and travel in industry from sending people off elsewhere in the world to sending them as happiness tourists to the Nordic countries. Because until that became, in some sense, an established fact, people were not watching. Now they're watching you. And so thank goodness that you're 
getting on board and doing what's needed in order to show what's special about life here, in order that those lessons can be learned by people elsewhere, because they're all learnable lessons. So the life evaluation is good because it covers everything. So there's nothing left out of it because it is life as a whole and you're trying to improve lives. And in, the, in the health, that's what your objective is, to improve lives. You're going to have to then go back to the WHO and say, by the way, you have healthy life years, but for healthy life years for, are years without disabilities. They say, no, that's not good enough. You want to have years that are happy years, so you should be measuring when healthy life expectancy should be happy life expectancy. What are the happy years? So you put as much time in creating happier lives for the people who are alive as you do in fixing their broken bones. The next thing about it, look at a primary measure, it's not an index of other things that we've put together, it's actually a democratic measure of the quality of people's lives provided by them. So it's primary information we can use to then try and explain what makes for a happy life. So it's a research base. Uh, and of course, also, and you watch this, right? You say you're above or below Norway this year, uh, you have to watch those error bounds. Is it really just random or is it something that's really sustained and big? And so that's the important thing about a primary measure you couldn't get from an index. And of course, it allows you then, the beauty about these things, they're collected from individuals everywhere, you can find out the happiness of different population groups, different regions, anything you want, so you can decompose and still have a valid primary measure, which is very powerful for showing differences and then trying to address them. And then, of course, you can then use this research about what's important to determine people's lives in order to put values on different aspects of their life that are likely to be changed when you're thinking of a different way of running schools or delivering health care. And uh, there are some implications of that. Furthermore, relative to shorter scales, an 11 point scale, zero to 10, is enough we can look at inequality. What's happened to the inequality of well-being? Income inequality is what people typically look at, but that's just like income is a small part of life, income inequality is a small part of total inequality. So you want to look at the, how that, are the people bunched at the top or on the bottom? Uh, these uh, six factors, so I've thrown inequality at the bottom, because it's, it's an important one, I'll get back to it, uh, are the ones we normally use. I'm not going to go through them in detail, except to say the healthy life expectancy, of which I've already talked about, which most of you work on on your day-to-day -day, uh, job, uh, and material support. The others all reflect the quality of the social context in which people live, and I'm going to delve deeply into that uh, as we move ahead. Uh, and so this simply, I'm not going to spend any time with this because I've got other things I have to do, but this shows what people mistakenly think that what we produce every year is an index based on these six factors. Uh, and that's a shame, so that's why I presented it the way I did. The, we, we get it, people themselves rank their happiness. This is just our attempt to find something more about the reasons for these differences. Now, I'm going to go through very quickly here, except that, that vertical line is the start of COVID. So we have now have two post-COVID years, 20 and 21. And you can see how strikingly uh, stable these were in the face of COVID. And positive and negative affect, look at negative affect. We heard about this earlier, uh, that there have been general movements up in several of the negative emotions and it especially took a jump for several of them in 2020 but you see quite a big recovery in uh, 2021. Here's something that's special and I'm going to get on to this uh, more importantly. What do you see there? You see we got that black line again and you can see for especially helping a stranger but for all of those there's a big jump up in every region of the world in the extent to which people help strangers. Now, be, 
We have to explain why overall life evaluations were so resilient in the face of COVID. One of the reasons why is that people had a chance to reach out beyond themselves and to help others. And it turns out that's such a primary source of happiness that even though times are terrible, to have that chance to help others and to exercise it can, keep, can produce a lot of happiness. So here's another one. Well, this is simply going at uh, helping a stranger each year. So this just shows you that 2021 was where the big increase happened in benevolent acts, and it was mainly in the helping of strangers. And it's in every region, as I suggested. Now I'm going to get deeper into the social sources. Uh, Felicia kindly gave you a nice insight into that literature because it's critically important uh, that humans are essentially social creatures, but they're more than that. They're essentially pro-social creatures, so that to give people the opportunity to do things for others is to do them a kindness. And you have to then, you're not say you're engaging somebody, it's not just to deliver health care, for example, you're not just saving money because you're using patients to help patients, you're helping patients, both the patients that are helping and the ones that are being helped by letting them create these circles of mutual caring. Here it is. So the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation having, was having a risk survey. How does risk of various kinds affect happiness? And they asked for my help with this, and I said, where are the positive risks? Where are the chances of something good happening? Why does risk always have to be the chance of something bad happening? So they put in a favorite question of ours, which is, if you're dropped a wallet with a lot of money in it, how likely is it to be found? If found by a stranger, a police officer, or a neighbor? And this was asked in this round, 2019 in 150 countries. And so we know quite a lot about it. So we then take, and I say, the happiness of all these people, what is it determined by? Well, we have all the standard variables, but on top of that, I mean, Unemployed is clearly one, a big negative, right? That's almost half a point on the 10-point scale. Harm from mental health, almost two-fifths of a point. Harm from violent crime. And this is, the, these two, two second ones are seen as very likely, okay? So then we said, okay, what about being very likely that your wallet, if found by a stranger, would be returned? And people who answer that question are higher by almost half a point, and uh, by a stranger, 0. 0.6, and a police officer, 0. 0.5. This is all in the same model, so if you think both of them would be very likely to return it, that's a full point, which is double the effect of being unemployed, much more than the effect that you're being subject to mental health issues. So it really matters to people to feel that they're in a community where others care about them, not just Honesty, this is not just trust. This is trust in others being there for you. And that's obviously critical. You can see from the size of these effects. All right, now here, here we am. I always like to play to the local audience, but the data play to the local audience. Look at that. Can you read it? Well, the blue bars are these life evaluations, average, for the year in which this was done in the Nordic countries, in the rest of Western Europe, and in all other countries of the world. Well, you can see a clear, those little vertical lines are 95% confidence regions. So these, these, are, these differences are very big differences. Steady sloping down, right? The Nordic countries are indeed the happiest countries. Well, you already knew that. But you didn't know that the expected wallet return is also much higher in the Nordic countries. Look at that. That's the gray ones. But then, some kind researchers dropped wallets in 50 countries all over the world. And we could see, is the actual return of wallets match what people expect across countries very well? So it's much higher expected in the countries where it's higher, which means you know, where the actual wallet return is higher, people are happier, they are more trusting, they are more likely to help each other. But look at the difference between the purple bar and the gray bars. The gray is what people expect of the benevolence of the people they live among. 
the purple bar is the actual wallets returned when found by a stranger. So everywhere, the wallet return is most highest in the Nordic countries, and that's a big source of Nordic happiness for reasons I've already told you about. But everywhere, people underestimate the benevolence of the people with whom they live. And that's a real downer. It's bad for their happiness, but what's more, right? If you had the right view about the benevolence of others, you'd be more likely to bicycle, have your children bicycle to school, or any number of things that you would do with confidence if you feel you're in a society where everybody is watching your back and where a stranger is simply a friend you haven't met yet. I, I'm going to switch through this because I often get a little blowback on these results about the Nordic countries, because people say that's just because they're small, insular, homogeneous countries, and it's easy to do all that. Well, first of all, small countries are no happier than big countries on average across the world. Secondly, the Nordic countries are among the top 15 in terms of immigrant receipt as the share of the population, if you look around the world. And what's more, uh, this is the source countries. This is to UK and Canada, because you've got really big surveys of lot, people coming from lots of countries, watch what happens when they migrate. They all move, not just to the level of life evaluation of the locally born in that country, but actually to the sub-region of the country they, they move in. And uh, you could see they move to a different average. Coming from the same countries, they move to a different average in Canada and the UK. So it's really telling you that the conditions of life that people have really affect the quality of their life. So the world's happiest immigrants are in Finland. Now, does that mean everybody should be going to Finland? Well, no, that's not going to work. We, we're talking about world happiness. We want to make everybody happier. You destroy Finland if you tried to put a billion people into it. The important point is to understand why life is happier in the Nordic countries, and every bit of it that I've talked about could be done anywhere. It's just a question of starting gradually and right. Uh, all right, this is, I'm uh, not doing too badly. Uh, inequality is bad, everybody thinks that, knows that, feels that, but the nice thing about these life evaluations, nice from a moral philosophy point of view, people often say, you know, this is about me and about what I think and what I do. People don't like living in a high inequality society. They are happier when other people have the kind of chances they have if they're already well off. And that's a very important thing to know. People then say, we've got to focus on the worst off and repair the damage. Well, you remember what I said that about the beginning? I said, that's not the right way to do it. You want to set an environment in which everybody can flourish and people don't drop off. If you have special programs for those who've dropped off, then they are stigmatized and the pro you get all kinds of difficulties. You want to start early and create an environment in which in the example we talked about earlier, loneliness simply doesn't happen because loneliness is not a disease that you wait until it appears and then cure it. It's, it's a condition for which you need a vaccine. And the vaccine, it's a friend. And there are no side effects of friends, and you can apply the remedy again and again, and loneliness does not appear. Well, what what more do you want? And people who are worried about inequality, this uh, that next result is kind of nice. Because it turns out the biggest beneficiaries of a higher trust society are the people who are in the worst circumstances. In ill health, low income, hungry, subject to discrimination. Because of course a low trust society hurts them more than it hurts people who can protect themselves better. So that's a very powerful result. And that means that Equality is better in a high-trust society. Okay, now to prove that, here's something we did a couple of years ago. We took the whole Western European distribution of life evaluations, and then we did some modeling using the European social survey data 
for all, all the European countries, found out how important it was to have close contacts with friends, to have trust in neighbors, to have trust in institutions. And then we said, what would the distribution of well-being in Europe look like if the rest of Europe had Nordic levels of trust in their institutions, trust in each other, and social connections? So the trust is the dark green, and the lighter green is what extra you gain from the friend link. So you could see trust is really what's driving this result. And you can see how, not only how much higher well-being would be, but how much smaller inequality would be if you had that. So when people come, make sure you tell them about what exactly on the ground it is that may, you know, Coats are not in check, coat checks here, they're hung on hooks. So a society where that's normal is a society where people assume everybody else watches their own back and they act accordingly. Now, because this, this is what I, paper I originally wrote before the topic of this session changed, uh, and here I'm speaking much more directly to the public health experts because this is about looking at why the Nordic countries did much better in COVID than other countries. And so uh, the particular study we used, uh, I'll, I'll get you the next thing which shows it. This was putting together two big data sets. So YouGov, Imperial College, had bi-weekly surveys uh, for 30 weeks from the April to the middle of 2021, 15 months, almost a, what, a third of a, a half a million people, and measured a whole lot of psychological outcomes, including a, a, a GHQ4. But you know, these surveys, they all measure the negative things, and they don't measure enough of the positive ones. But one positive one we did get in was the life evaluation. So we have one positive, if you like, and a, a, a package indicator of a negative one. Then we got the Oxford tracker data for stringency, policy stringency, and used their index, as well as their various subcomponents, over those same time periods. So we could look within each country what the dynamics of policy stringency did for well, deaths on the one hand, but also on people's mental health by these things. So this is one of the key questions people have wanted to know about. Because after all, people who were against acting quickly or in large amount to stop COVID in its tracks were doing so because they thought those measures would hurt people's mental health. I mean, that was, that's the primary one. There are other things as well. So we were able to focus precisely on that. We did find, in fact, that policy stringency does worsen mental health. This is sort of the dynamics within a country, as you might guess, right? Not a big effect, but it's an effect. Uh, deaths, on the other hand, of course, made people unhappy too. And of course, the stringency is supposed to remove the deaths. So we, you, you put the whole business together and work out the dynamics within a country. But when we'd finished this first analysis, we said that's not really what we want to focus on. We want to look at policy strategies. We want to compare for the overall average success of the policy. Was it better in countries that tried to eliminate the virus or in ones that choose to mitigate? And so, there are these 15 countries, we split them into two groups, uh, two times two, because the first one we did is something we'd done earlier in the previous year's World Happiness Report. Uh, we used as a measure of countries that were trying to eliminate it, membership in the Western Pacific region of the WHO, for reasons you will know. Those were all countries that had experience with SARS, and they were all set up to move in quickly, and they all did move in quickly. Uh, and uh, in this sample of 15, that includes Australia, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. And then we had all the rest of the countries. So the rest of the countries included four Nordic countries, and not all five were in this 15-country sample. And then the others were major European countries, plus Canada, which is the only one not, not in Europe or in East Asia. So now, this is, I'm going to give you two sets of results. The first is, in general, 
eliminators versus mitigators. So in this one, the Nordic countries are in the mitigator group. And then I'm going to break down the mitigator group between the uh, Nordic countries and the rest, and again within the Nordic countries. So what do you see here? Well, uh, the uh, cantral ladder difference was there before. It was lower in the eliminators before, and it didn't get any more lower uh, during COVID, so nothing there. Uh, essentially the same on PHQ4, the mental distress variables. Annual deaths, you can see, were 64 in the mitigators. Uh, this is a SIP per 100K average, uh, annual average o measured over this 15-month period, while six in the eliminators. And the stringency index, look at that, you see. Is there a trade-off is the question. And you see the actual average stringency in the eliminator countries was less than in the mitigator countries. And you all know why, right? You tried to keep everything open, and then you found the system getting overburdened, and you had to come in late and inefficient. And in fact, you needed, on average, uh, over this 15 months, more stringency than the countries that had acted with a better design package, it's true, but also more quickly. And now we go within the Nordic countries, and this is where we get back to some of our major items. Oh, I'm, uh, huh, okay, but this is important, <laughs> but I'm going to skip a bit. Uh, on sustainability, we have a panel discussion that's going to follow this. And so I'll make my sustainability points in that panel discussion, so I'm not going to run over, over time here. Uh, but I do want to finish this for the public health people. These are now putting 20 and 21 together and looking uh, these categories. And now we've now broken Nordics, Sweden, other Nordics, other Western Europe, Canada, and the eliminators. Well, you can see the eliminators uh, obviously had the best results in that 15. Uh, and then the Nordic, excluding Switzerland, then Canada, and then Sweden and other Western Europe. Uh, and you can see uh, some people say the excess deaths is all that counts because you've got to roll everything in. Well, you could see it doesn't really matter which of those statistics you use. These are pretty good counter countries, most of them anyway. Um, and now we're going at it country by country because I know I can't, I can't duplicate your accents, but I know you're from different countries, and so you can find your own country uh, there. And you, you already know these numbers, um, but it's uh, quite uh, remarkable. And here's what happens when you add the data, because of course this was who got it right in 20 and 21, but the game changed at the end of 2021, and Omicron came in, and of course vaccines were already there, uh, and it's a different game. As you can see what's happened in the 22 statistics, those death rates are much higher than you might have thought in the abstract, um, and they're much more equal across the regions of the world, and essentially it's because most countries are doing the same thing at this stage. Sweden started looking like, in terms of what it did, the other Nordic countries in 2021, and uh, they're all pretty similar in 2022. So this is a little discouraging in a way. It said the lesson uh, was an important lesson for that period and that type of virus, um, but when one that gets an R value like some of the Omicrons, uh, it, it, it's a different game that uh, I have to admit uh, we don't really know how to deal with. And uh, speaking to the health authorities, I can say it's really a shame you don't keep track better of the data, uh, because if you had those data, it'd be a lot easier to figure out what has gone on and how you might want to react differently uh, in the future. Uh, now, uh, I've got to leave time at the end because I was so overjoyed by the chance to have that childhood dream of being on stage with a real opera singer. I'd like to do it again. Are you up, are you up for it? Because this, this next song is what some people call a social capital theme song. And it explains exactly the essence 
of the lessons that come out of all those numbers I've given you. So if you can sing this, you say, did I learn anything today? Yes, I learned, and then you can, you can belt this out to your kids. And they'll probably know it. Come on. <laughs> it's an encore, it's an encore. <laughs> Bless you for waiting. <laughs>